All right, so today's discussion is going to be on the wave nature of light. Let's get going. Uh, this is going to be the start of the second half of the electromagnetic radiation unit. So we have a new notebook to work with. It's not going to be the first part anymore. We're now moving on to the second part. We're going to look at how light can behave today as both a particle and as a wave. Now, the primary focus will be light behaving as a wave. And um, we'll also look at the evidence that shows that light behaves as a wave as opposed to behaving as a particle. It can behave as both, but we're going to be focusing on, again on the evidence that it behaves as a wave. Uh, we're going to learn some formulas for working with a famous experiment called Young's Double Slit Experiment. I'll explain what that means a little later on, uh, which of course helps show the wave nature of light. Now before you finish or continue watching this video, there was a video that I posted that you should have watched before, just kind of explaining how light can be thought of as both a particle and a wave. Uh, hopefully you've already watched it. If you haven't, please just leave this video and go and watch it. This is the video right here. I'm not going to play it. We're just going to skip it. Uh, we're going to move on to the models of light. Uh, so Sir Isaac Newton, he was the one who developed the particle model of light, which he believed could explain reflection and refraction. Uh, basically, long story short, Newton came up with this idea that light was behaving as a particle, and people just accepted it mostly just because, well, it was, you know, it was Isaac Newton, and he was kind of, whoops, Isaac Newton, and he was kind of a big deal. Um, so people just accepted it, but then as the years went on, people went, oh, wait, no, this doesn't actually work. There are some flaws with this. So eventually we came to adapt something called the quantum model of light, which is now the currently accepted theory. So the Huygens Fresnel principle can be used to explain the behavior of waves as they enter different mediums and can be applied to light as well. So before we talked uh, about how light can refract when it enters uh, a different medium of a different density than the one it came from, uh, and with that, we actually discussed something called Snell's Law. Snell's Law was this big chain of equations where you basically can just mix and match whichever equations you'd like to use to serve whatever purpose. For, for instance, if you were interested in the angles of incidence and angle of refraction, and you were uh, interested in the wavelengths, you would use this piece equal to this piece, right? We've already covered this, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on this. I just wanna remind you that N in this, so these, these are the refractive indexes of the mediums, right? It's also a little bit weird in Snell's law that uh, they're all the first one on the top except for your refractive index. The refractive index part of this equation has N2 on the top. So the refractive index of the thing that you're entering compared to the one that you came from. Um, but you know that again is on your formula sheet. So again, uh, further experiments in the 1800s, this actually confirmed that the speed of light decreases in denser media, which clearly disproved Newton's previous theory. Again, you don't need to know that too well. Basically, the bottom line is Snell's law does apply for light as well. In other words, light will slow down uh, and therefore it kind of behaves as a wave because wavelength is part of Snell's law as well. Uh, now, the next thing we need to talk about that kind of explains uh, how light can be thought of as a wave is the concept of diffraction. And we first learned about diffraction back in physics 20. Uh, in case you've forgotten what diffraction is, diffraction was an observed property uh, of waves that basically just says that when a wave uh, approaches an opening, it diffracts out in like this wave, like circular wave kind of pattern, right? So in other words, it stops becoming like this linear wave and becomes more of these round spread out waves. Now the rule is uh, the wavelength actually has to be, hold on, let me get this right. Let me, let me reword this. All I'm saying here, first of all, is this picture is really garbage. The slit actually needs to be smaller than the wavelength. That's what I'm trying to say here. This picture shows the slit being bigger than the wavelength, which is what I really don't like about it. In order for this diffraction pattern to occur, your opening needs to be smaller than the wavelength. And the same works for light as well. Now you gotta think about most kinds of light. Most kinds of light have a very, very, very small wavelength. So that could prove to be a challenge. Um, but again, with certain other kinds of light, like radio waves, which have uh, wavelengths that are as long as one kilometer, uh, it's pretty easy to get an opening like this. So radio waves can fan out in this diffraction pattern with an opening that's actually not all that big, you know, relatively speaking. All right, so this is bringing us into something called Poisson's spot. So diffraction is easily shown with water waves, but it wasn't until the 17th century that it was observed with light. Uh, yada, 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 basically long story short, because uh, normal light waves, like visible light waves, have such a small wavelength, the slit opening must be extremely small in order to observe significant diffraction. So in other words, to get a diffraction pattern, pattern you have to have a very small opening for that to work. Now, another thing that makes this a little easier to detect, however, is diffraction also occurs when waves are passed around a spherical object. So in other words, if you have some sort of spherical object and you're passing uh, a wave through it, 
the, the pattern of disturbance formed from that spherical object disturbing the wave is actually going to be a classical diffraction pattern. Now with light, they've actually been able to prove that light behaves as a wave by uh, noting that a single bright spot is observed in the center of the dark circular shadow behind that spherical object, and they call that Poisson's spot, based off the name of the scientist who figured this out. So for a diagram showing what Poisson's spot really is here, this model has uh, like a light source. That's what this is right here. There's a light source, it's beaming light towards a spherical object, uh, and then there's a screen quite a distance away from the, the circular spherical object uh, where the shadow is being projected. Now what happens is when you have this light uh, source beaming light on the sphere, you get your round uh, circular shadow as you would expect, but oftentimes this little bright spot appears right in the center. And that's kind of bizarre because if you thought that, life, that light sorry, behaved as a uh, particle, there'd be no explanation for this because the light particles would be hitting this and then bouncing off in each every direction and you'd just be with you know, a full complete filled in shadow. Uh, but what's happening here is when the light strikes this, uh, if you have your pattern set up just right, the waves get disturbed, and for the most part, they do create this circular shadow, but some of the disturbed waves end up conglomerating and striking this center point here. So in other words, the only way for this bright spot to appear in the center of a shadow is if light behaves as a wave rather than behaving as a particle. Moving on. So another proof of the wave model of light was the observance of interference patterns when light is passed through small slits. So we're going to get into this in a second, but let me just remind you that interference is an effect resulting from the passage of two like waves through each other. There's constructive interference, which is where they yoink like that, really big, they go really big, that's constructive. And then there's destructive interference where they kind of like nullify each other out. They kind of like slowly cancel each other out and they hit that midline again. Both constructive and destructive interference also occur with light, and this actually ends up uh, being expressed in the intensity of the light. A very bright spot is a place where there was constructive interference, and a very dark spot is a place where there was destructive interference. And that comes back to this. Constructive and destructive interference are seen with water waves when passed through slits. Same thing can be seen with light. Uh, so diffraction grating is a sheet of uh, glass or plastic with a large number of parallel lines that can be used in place of a double slit to produce an interference pattern. This will make a lot more sense when we see the picture, so I'm not even going to waste my time. Uh, so here's a good picture of it, actually. Uh, it shows a light source, so light is being beamed through. This one's kind of an interesting one because they actually have two slits, or like two different screens with slits in them, uh, diffracting the light. So when the light went through this opening, because the opening is smaller than the wavelength, it creates a diffraction pattern. And that's, again, why this picture is so much better, because you can clearly see that this little opening is much smaller than this wavelength right here. Uh, so anyway, you get your diffraction pattern, so it forms out like a fan, and then the light waves also go through these slits, which is again why this is so interesting, because usually we only see one uh, screen, but whatever, it's still a good picture. Uh, and from these, they're again diffracting onwards to produce yet another wave pattern. Now what happens between these two slits is you get your wave pattern being formed, but there are points where these two wave patterns overlap one another. And as they overlap, and as the wave goes through, if you had a screen where this light was being projected, you'd actually find the points at which these light waves from both of these two nodes, or I mean, sorry, both of these two slits um, are overlapping, you're going to get some bright spots or bright lines on the screen, right? That's because of constructive interference. The light waves are like combining together to form like a super light wave, I guess, if we're going to be really unofficial and unscientific about it, uh, to form this really bright spot. And the opposite is happening uh, with the dark spots right here. The dark spots are occurring where there's destructive interference, where the light waves are actually canceling each other out and producing nothing right there. Uh, now, the other thing we should just note on this uh, is there's some terminal, terminology for these bright and dark spots, and they're kind of counter, counterintuitive to what you think they would be. These bright spots are actually called anti-nodes, and the dark spots are actually called nodes. Uh, if you're going to ask me why are the bright ones anti-nodes and the dark ones just nodes, to tell you the honest truth, I don't really know. Um, it's just the naming convention system they came up with. There probably is a good reason for it. My best guess would be kind of a haul back to Physics 20, where we talked about nodes on a wave as being like the points that don't move. And I guess points that aren't moving on here are going to produce dark spots. That would be my best guess as to why they're called uh, nodes for the dark spots and anti-nodes for the bright spots, because again, bright spots are bouncing up and down, but I'm not 100% certain on that. That would just be my best educated guess. Uh, the other thing I want to point out in this diagram, because it will be useful going on, notice right in between 
these two openings, so like right at the middle point here, straight across from that, you end up getting a bright antinode. This is actually a very important bright antinode because it's often called your central antinode. And this is going to be really useful for some calculations we're going to do in just a few minutes here. Uh, here's another video. This one's optional. I'll leave it in the, uh, the week plan. You don't have to watch it. It's just, it's just a really good visual uh, showing Young's double slit experiment. It's quite long, but up to you. If you want to watch it, go for it. Uh, so Thomas Young was the first scientist to do this, blah, 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 blah. Okay, and this usually, if we had a normal class, I would draw a whole system. Because we've already done it a couple slides ago, ooh, right here, because we've already seen it, I'm not going to redraw it. The drawing actually just illustrates what all the variables are going to be in here. I'll get to that in a little bit, so we're not going to worry about that uh, quite now. Let's see. There we go. Okay, good. So diffraction pattern. Another thing I want to mention about this, I'll just go through this super quick here. Um, if you have monochromatic light, that's just a fancy way of saying one color. So like this, uh, your antinodes, your bright lines, those are actually going to be uh, that same color. But what's interesting is if you used white light instead of just a certain monochromatic light, white light actually ends up producing a whole spectrum of colors uh, at those points. Uh, and again, that's because white light is actually a combination of all of the colors of the, uh, the visible light spectrum. So of course, once it's going through here, all of those different colors, which all have their different wavelengths and they all have different frequencies, they're going to bend in different manners. Uh, so they're not all going to end up in the exact same place. Uh, now the pattern, just in case this is useful at some point, I don't remember if it will be, um, but the pattern is your violet light. So when it breaks off into its spectrum, its, its spectrum, the violet light is always the one closest to your central maximum antinode, right? This is a little bit opposite how diffraction of colors occurs using a prism. Again, let's not worry about that. Let's just move on. All right, so here's where things get really, really important. These are all the formulas. And you're probably already looking at this and going, oh, holy smokes, and I don't blame you. There are a lot of different variables to keep track of. Uh, I would highly advise, especially for, for us working at home uh, with this whole new system right now, uh, I would highly advise you just jot these down somewhere and have like a little cheat sheet because these are even tough for me to remember. I'm not gonna lie, as I go through some of these practice problems, I might peek back at some of these, right? Just to check what were these for again, what was representing what? Um, but eventually after you do enough of these questions, it becomes a little bit more like clockwork and you get a little more used to it. Uh, the letters don't often make sense. Like for instance, X always throws me. X is the distance between your central antinode, that's the bright one, like that central bright spot, uh, and your given node or antinode that you're gonna be looking at. So if I'm saying, or you're looking at your third antinode, uh, X is the distance between them. Why X? I have no idea. That's just the way they set it up. That's just the way it goes. Uh, anyway, so you need to know all of these different variables. It's really important. Make a cheat sheet though. It'll, uh, it'll really help you. Uh, these formulas, however, this is what you're actually going to be using for calculations. If you don't mind, I'm just going to reach and grab my own formula sheet here because I'm not sure if all of these are on the formula sheet themselves. Um, no, it looks like only these two are. But the good news is this top one is the same thing as this middle one. and They just moved the N over, right? So really, it's just these two that you need to know. And this one, I have something very important to let you know. We've never actually seen a formula like this in physics uh, because it is actually kind of picky as to when it can be used. Most formulas, you're just told, you know what, use them whenever they apply. But this one is called the small angle approximation. This formula right here can only be used if your angle, your angle in your question is less than 10 degrees. I don't know why. I, I think it's just because this is just a really loose estimation of it. I, I haven't actually broken down where this equation comes from. You don't need to know where the equation comes from. All you need to know is this is not an end-all be-all. You can only use this formula if your angle is less than 10 degrees. Otherwise, you have to use this. Uh, and if you're looking for things like X or L, you're kind of out of luck. You have to do it some other way, right? This is only an approximation. Uh, there are other ways of getting around finding X now. You could use trigonometry, for instance. Uh, if you had a diagram in particular, that makes it a lot more clear. But this formula is only useful if you have an angle less than 10 degrees. Really important that you don't accidentally use it when you can't. And I'll show you an example where, where you have to check in order, to, in order to use it, right? But we'll get to that. So here's our first example. Um, tell you what, I'm actually going to skip this one. Uh, and I'm skipping this one because it is actually something that just relies on our universal wave equation. So if you want to try this on your own, go for it. It's V equals F lambda. That's the formula you're going to have to use. That's not even a formula we talked about today. That's just your old universal wave equation. I don't see a reason in doing this. 
Uh, this one, however, this one is going to be a lot more important. Monochromatic light, so in other words, one color, is incident, that means it's hitting, uh, two slits separated by 0.30 millimeters. Uh, and the first bright fringe, which I guess is just another way of saying anti-node, is located at an angle of 0 0.080 degrees from the central anti-node. That's a pretty small angle. That's like not really a big deal at all. Uh, what is the wavelength of the light? All right, here's how we go about these questions. Make sure you list out all of your variables that you know right off the bat, and then list the variable that you're looking for. Just like what we used to do way back in physics 20 with kinematics or dynamics, it's an extremely important strategy because it lets you get all your information put together. First of all, the uh, incident on two slits separated by this. Okay, so the two slits are separated by this amount of space. We need to know what variable is represented by that. If I want, I can go back and just check a few slides back. Well, the distance between slits is D. So in other words, that value they gave us the 0 0.30 millimeters is D. You just need to make sure that you're putting that in meters. We don't like these millimeters. Let's have a common unit here. So we'll say D equals changing this into meters. I'm just going to be lazy about it. I'm going to say 0 0.30 times 10 to the negative three, because that's what we do to get rid of the milli part of that, right? So times 10 to the negative three meters. Next thing we know, it's the first bright fringe. In other words, the first bright anti-node. Well, that one I don't have to go back to. I remember that N is the order of your node or your anti-node. You know what, I will go back because I don't know if it actually said, oh, it did say node and anti-node. Okay, good. My old answer key said just said node, and really it should be node or anti-node. It works for both. Uh, anyway, N is uh, the letter we're looking for here. Since it's your first bright fringe, you can say N is just one. There's no units on that. It's just the order of it, so it's just the, the one that appeared. Uh, it's located at an angle of this much from the central anti-node. Well, that's going to be your theta. Technically, it's theta N. Sometimes I just drop the n because it's kind of silly, but whatever. Theta n is 0 0.080 degrees. Uh, and is there anything else we have in this question? It doesn't really look like it, um, but we might as well write what we're looking for. We're looking for wavelength. Wavelength is lambda, so lambda is our unknown. Next thing I do when I do these questions is uh, I look at my formulas and I say, do I have enough information to solve this already? Well, there really is only two formulas, like I kind of said earlier. There's lambda equals d sine theta n over n. And then there's the small angle approximation, which is lambda equals xd over nl. Now what's nice about this question is we do have a small angle. So this small angle approximation would work. But the trouble is, and it's kind of ironic in this case, we don't have x and we don't have l. So in other words, as much as this is one of those cases where I was like, oh cool, you can use your small angle approximation. There's no reason to do so in this question because you don't have x and you don't have l. So why would you use the small angle approximation? It doesn't make any sense. This equation on the other hand, which is also used to uh, find your wavelength, we have d, we have theta n, and we have n. So why not just use this one? There are certain cases where you need to use a small angle approximation, but this is not one of them. We already have all the information we need. So lambda, your wavelength, equals d, 0 0.30 times 10 to the negative 3, times sine theta n, so sine 0 0.080. Now might be a good time to let you know, make sure your calculator is in degree mode when you're doing that, because that is an amount in degrees, uh, and then divide that by n, so divide it by one. Throwing that in my calculator and then looking that I have to have my answer just to two sig digs, it is looking like the answer would be 4.2 times 10 to the negative seven, and it's a wavelength, so it's in meters. There we go. That's all there was to that one. Next one's gonna be a little beefier. All right, so we have a student measuring the wavelength of light emitted by a krypton gas sample. Uh, they're directing the light through two slits separated by 0 0.264 millimeters. Hey, the distance between two slits. We talked about that in the last one. I remember what letter that is, hopefully you do too. It's D equals 0 0.264. Once again, they use millimeters. Joke's on us, we can just go times 10 to the negative three meters. There we go, that one's all done. An interference pattern is created on a screen three meters from the slits. Okay, you might not remember this, but uh, the distance from one screen to the slits is actually your uh, L, I believe. Ooh, maybe, uh, just in case I'm wrong, let's go back. Ooh, I was right. Distance between midpoint of slits and the given node, anti-node, that would be L. Yes, we are good. We are very, very good. 
See, I know what I'm doing, right? But I checked just in case I didn't, right? So that's always good. So L is going to be three meters. That's important. We have that. Uh, now the distance between the second bright fringe, ho oh, ho, second bright fringe. There you go. That tells us N is two. And the central maximum is measured to be 1.18 meters or centimeters. Ooh, sorry. My brain kind of just turned off there for a second. Well, that 1.18 centimeters is the distance from that anti-node, it's a bright fringe, so it's an anti-node, the distance from our anti-node to the central maximum, okay? Remember, both of those occur on the same screen. If this is your central maximum and this is your anti-node, we're talking about this distance here. What was that distance called again? It was the one that I always have a hard time remembering, but I remembered it just because I mentioned it. This one's X. So X is gonna be that 1.18 centimeters. We need to turn that into meters though. Uh, that's easy enough to turn into meters. I don't have to use this whole times 10 to the negative, whatever. Uh, we'll just say that's 0 0.0118 meters. Now, what this question is looking for is the frequency of light. So frequency is what we're looking for here. But let's remind ourselves uh, of what formulas we have. We have lambda equals uh, d sine theta n over n. And we have lambda equals x d over n l. We're looking for a frequency though. We're, we only have formulas that have a wavelength. But wait a minute, we need to remember that frequency, especially of light, is connected to the wavelength. And it's connected through a little thing that we've always called the universal wave equation. V equals F lambda. So if we find lambda, we can find F because we also know V. V, of course, is just the speed of light. So we'll come back to that a little later. The question is now, since we can find the wavelength to find our frequency, which one of these two formulas are we going to have to use? Well, we're kind of hooped one way or another here. When you look at this formula on the left, uh, you can see we have D, but we don't know what the angle is, uh, but we have N, right? So if we were to use this formula on the left, we'd have to find what the angle is. The one on the right is our small angle approximation. We have no idea what our angle is here, but we do have X, we do have D, we have N, and we have L. Now, as tempting as it is just to say, you know what, I have all the information, I can just use this, forget about it. Let's just hope and pray that the angle is less than 10 degrees and get it done. As easy as it is to say that, we can't make that assumption. We should draw ourselves a picture and figure out, is this actually a case where we can use this? The good news is, that means we'd have to find the angle, and if it wasn't less than 10 degrees, like let's say the angle was something like 55 degrees or something, uh, then we would already have our angle from finding that, we could just use this other formula. So there you go, boom, we don't have to worry about it. Let's draw a picture. This is gonna be our screen. Central maximum is gonna be in the center here. And then I'll draw my other one with the double slits. Kind of like that, right? I'm not drawing this to scale. It doesn't really matter uh, to draw it to scale, just as long as you get the idea down. Now, our second bright fringe is gonna be, let's say over here. Really doesn't matter where I draw it. I could have drawn it on the other side. Uh, this is my second bright fringe. So we know this distance from my central to my second fringe, we know that that distance right there is going to be your X, or in other words, 1.18 centimeters, or 0 0.0118. Uh, now, the other thing that we know is that the distance from uh, the slits and the screen is three meters. So that would actually be this distance here. Uh, when we talk about the distance from the slits to the screen, uh, we're actually talking about that midpoint between the slits, right? Because it's just kind of the average. Uh, and generally speaking, if these are two parallel uh, lines, they should be the same no matter what, as long as it's a straight line. But anyway, uh, we'll draw it like this. That's 3.0 meters. We know this measure, you can tell this is wildly not to scale, um, but this, we know this measure here. We know the angle can be measured across like so, and that is what we're looking for, that angle right in the middle there. Since we know this opposite side from the angle, and we know the adjacent side to the angle, we can use trigonometry to figure out what that angle would be. Opposite and adjacent show up in tan. So tan theta equals opposite 0 0.0118 over adjacent 3.0. Take the inverse tan of both sides of that, make sure you're in degree mode as usual, and you're gonna get uh, theta equals about 0 0.225 degrees. So quite clearly, it's less than 10 degrees. That is way less than 10 degrees. It's not even close. Uh, so we are actually okay to use our small angle approximation. 
What's neat about this though is, if you would prefer to use this formula, you are more than welcome to do so. It's only gonna be off by a very small, insignificant amount. You can use either one of these formulas if you wish. But because this angle is less than 10 degrees, I'm gonna use the small angle approximation just because I can. So lambda equals x, which is 0 0.0118 times d, which is 0 0.264 times 10 to the negative three, divided by n, which is two, times by L, which is 3.0. Throwing this in your calculator, you're gonna get lambda, your wavelength, is equal to about 5.192 times 10 to the negative seven meters. But that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for F. Well, F can come out of this formula up here. So let's set that all equal to each other. V is the speed of light, 3.00 times 10 to the eight, equals F which is what we're looking for, times lambda, which is 5.192 times 10 to the negative seven. Whew, divide it over and you're gonna find that F is equal to, with two sig digs, 5.8 times 10 to the 14, and it's a frequency, so that is measured in Hertz. Doesn't matter which formula you use for that. If you use this other one here, D sine theta over N, you would have gotten the exact same answer. It works the same one way or another. That brings us to the end of today. So we'll finish the rest of the examples from that section. Again, that was the part two section. We'll finish the rest of the examples from that section next class, because we didn't actually get through the whole lesson. It was too much. Um, but I do want you to work on the Wave Nature of Light worksheet, page nine to 14. And again, that is in the part two booklet. The answer key is posted on the, uh, the Google Classroom page. Uh, but again, if you need any help, please let me know. Talk to you soon.